Earth Science, Streams and Floods. Um, look at the picture here. What's going on? What does this have to do with streams and floods? Well, you've got a dam and there's water under high pressure above that dam and some engineers are letting water out at the bottom of that dam and um, an example of why a dam like this is important is in Tulsa the uh, Arkansas River used to flood regularly and caused lots of flooding problems in the uh, low part of town close to the river. Well the Keystone Dam was built and other dams upriver on that Arkansas River and it, it's controlled that flooding so that the uh, that part of the city doesn't doesn't get underwater now. Um, one of the challenges though is the dam fills up with sand behind it and one of these years somebody's going to have to figure out what to do with the sand that's filling up the dam behind the, behind the dam as that, that sand no longer flows on down the river. So rivers have had big impacts on, on humans and human civilization um, um, ever since um, humans were created. And here we have an example of the Nile River. Um, the earliest civilizations um, took place in um, river valleys like the Nile River or the Tigris-Euphrates River in um, now in modern day Iraq or in the Indus River now in modern day Pakistan. Well, a stream, a river, a stream is any flow of water through a channel defined by its banks from the smallest creek to the largest river. Um, the Nile River here flows from the south to the north. It's um, about 6,800 kilometers long and it drops 1,800 meters in elevation from the source in uh, Uganda um, down to the Mediterranean Sea in Egypt. Um, and it actually starts even in Burundi um, and flows through Uganda is probably a better way to say that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, humans have been diverting water for flooding um, from the Nile River uh, for 5,000 years and that's what um, the reason he, Egypt has been a breadbasket. It's the reason Joseph was able to grow food for the um, Jacob and his family to come down during the famine because Egypt had the Nile River and it was a breadbasket for that part of the world. So the history of the Nile il illustrates how organisms in the, in the vicinity of a stream can be placed under considerable stress when significant changes occur in stream systems. Well, we tend to take rivers and streams for granted but they're really important. Um, they bring water to us, they give us drinking water, they give us um, the ability to cool power plants, we can have cheap transportation on rivers. Um, they, there's ecosystems around rivers, um, uh, recreation sites on rivers. Mark Twain wrote some really interesting books about um, being a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi, if you want to read Life in the Mississippi. Um, <clears throat> In uh, eastern Oklahoma, uh, uh, Senator Kerr, I believe from Kansas, um, built um, a way for ocean going ocean barges to come all the way up to uh, Catoosa. Uh, and his goal was to try and get ocean barges all the way up from the Mississippi River on up into Kansas, but he died before he was able to do that. But um, we got him up into eastern Oklahoma. So rivers have been important ever for humans and um, ever since um, humans started interacting with rivers and um, growing food. And so here's, here's some questions you might want to think about. What river is nearest to where you live? Where, where does the river begin and where does it end? Um, how do people interact with streams? How do, they, how do streams fit with biology, economics, culture, politics, history, recreation, aesthetics? Um, Earth science is very much involved with how people interact with um, these systems and so in this in this lecture we're talking about the systems around rivers and streams. Uh, before we get into that we need to look at the hydrologic cycle and you need to know the hydrologic cycle and understand it. Um, if we just kind of summarize it here, water evaporates from the oceans 
It rises into the atmosphere. As it rises, it condenses to form clouds. And um, water in those clouds is released as precipitation, so it rains or snows. And, and that may be over land, it may be over streams, it may be over the oceans. Anyway, it rains or snows. And then that water either sinks underground where it runs off in streams, where it gets caught into lakes and ponds, um, or it's absorbed by plants. And then plants give off water back in the atmosphere by what's called transpiration. So here's some terms you'll need to understand. Infiltration is when water sinks into the ground and becomes groundwater. Uh, groundwater is fresh water whereas this ocean is salt water and um, when we get into the uh, chapter on, um, on, on looking, looking at coastlines we'll see we'll talk more about uh, the interaction between freshwater groundwater and and uh, seawater groundwater a little bit more about the hydrologic cycle water in streams doesn't just come from rainfall it also comes from groundwater um, groundwater is a big factor in, in making sure streams don't uh, just uh, get lower and lower and lower. And then evaporation is when water vapor gets into the air from lakes, rivers, streams, the ocean, my water glass, and transpiration, transpiration is when water vapor enters the air from plants. Most water is in the oceans, 97%, about 3% of water is on the land, and just a very small amount of water is in the atmosphere. So most water is in the ocean, 3% on the land. 77% of that um, 3% is ice, and most of that is in, south, is in, is in uh, the south, south Pole at Antarctica, the glaciers were in the, the South Pole. And that's one reason the ocean levels are as low as they are, is because a lot of water is... Um, trapped in the glaciers in Newfoundland and the South Pole, or not Newfoundland, in Greenland, in Greenland and the South Pole. Um, so 77% um, of the water on land, of the 3% of water is on ice, mostly in glaciers, and about 22% of water is in groundwater. Um, and then a, a minor amount of water is in soil, moisture, plants, animals, or in lakes and streams. And um, <clears throat> most evaporation comes out of the ocean, so most of the water gets into the atmosphere from evaporation of the ocean, some evaporation from land, and um, percentage-wise there's more precipitation over land than evaporation. Um, so uh, because we have more water coming out of the oceans, it gives us the ability to have more rainfall on the land. Let's look at some of the relationships between these terms. Um, water infiltrates into the groundwater and gets into the uh, spaces that are between uh, the um, rocks and clays that, that are in the, in the soil and um, in the rocks. Um, water runs off into streams when we have one form of precipitation is rainfall. Uh, water vapor is a gas. Um, when water melts from ice, we call that meltwater. And when water vapor enters the atmosphere from plants, we call that transpiration. Well, where do streams come from? Well, many, such as the Colorado River, come from small streams on the slopes of mountains. Their water source can be snow melt from the mountains or rainwater running off the slopes. Um, that's true of the Arkansas River that comes down. Um, we'll, we'll look at the Arkansas River in detail here in a little bit. Um, the source of the mighty Mississippi comes from a small lake in Minnesota. Here we have a picture of Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. And you get uh, the um, Allegheny River on the left and the Monongahela River on the right. And they join together to form the Ohio River. So you two rivers end and the Ohio River starts at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, some other things to think about. 
the majority of precipitation on land runs off into the streams into the uh, ocean in what we call streams and on average the length of time that a given volume of water remains in the stream is only about two weeks or 14 days so if you take a drop of water and you drop that um, in a stream somewhere on average it's going to be in the ocean within 14 days from where it starts and only a small amount of precipitation on land sinks into the ground as infiltration rates are really slow most water runs off into streams however the volume of water stored in groundwater is a lot larger than the amount of water in lakes and streams 70 times greater there's lots more water in groundwater than there is in lakes and streams and it got put in there a long time ago well ice storm stores about three times the volume of water found in groundwater um, remember uh, this slide where we showed 77 percent of um, water on land is stored in us ice and 22 percent stored as um, as groundwater well that's that three times uh, many rivers have their sources in springs that bring ground, groundwater to the surface springs um, central Africa um, start the source of the Nile River many rivers have source in glacial meltwater uh, like the Ganges River the Brahmaputra River and the Himalayas uh, meltwater from glaciers is the source of those two rivers well imagine that it rained continually all over the world for a month um, if we we're going to measure the depth of the oceans over a five-day period near the end of the month what would we observe well what we'd observe is that uh, ocean depths would stay the same because precipitation would be balanced by water loss in the oceans by evaporation unless there's water coming from somewhere else which um, according to the hydrologic cycle water is constant um, around the earth let's look at some uh, different parts of the hydrologic cycle and just looking at one of them um, arrow 2 points from land to the atmosphere so how does water get from land into the atmosphere it gets there from evaporation well how does water get from the atmosphere into streams number three well that would be precipitation how does water get from streams into groundwater that would be infiltration so you get the idea um, it's a good idea to go through this thing and think about um, in the hydrologic cycle you might look at the picture in your book and think about just how water goes um, from one part of the hydrologic cycle to the other so you get used to these terms um, just just saying that probably be a, a, a good exercise to get used to thinking in terms of a um, just a flow chart like this well regardless of where they start streams flow downhill <laughs> we know that water flows downhill um, and often they join other streams to form a network and in the end the streams empty into another body of water water it could be another stream like we saw with the Ohio River two, two, two rivers emptied into another river and we call it the Ohio River um, it could be a lake could be an ocean could be a reservoir a wetland the lowest point at which a stream flows is called the base level there's a good definition for you to know the base level is the very end of a river or stream when it flows into another body of water and we've listed a bunch of them right there so let's look at drainage networks and patterns and that last slide was a good segue into this you see some uh, drainage networks and patterns in a number of different drainage basins including the Missouri River, ba River Basin, uh, the, the Upper Mississippi Drainage Basin, the Ohio Drainage Basin, the Tennessee D Drainage Basin, and the Arkansas Drainage Basin, which we'll look at in, in a lot, quite a bit of detail here in a few minutes, and the Red River Drainage Basin. Um, well, let's define what a drainage basin is to start with. It's an area drained by a stream and its smaller streams. Okay, well, if I put a drop of water on see that red line continental divide if I drop a drop of water to the east of that red line it will flow east a drop of water to the west of that 
needle sharp line or razor sharp line it goes to the west so that's the continental divide and um, a drainage basin is the same idea only um, if you drop drop a water between somewhere between the Missouri and the Arkansas basin uh, one drops going to one way one drops going to go the other way looking at drainage um, network patterns in the state of Ohio we see a number of different drainage basins there and um, they flow from high ground to low ground so if you take um, let's say the, the Great Miami um, drainage basin there it flows into that, that blue area all flows from there into that point um, um, go, emptying into the Ohio River at this in the southern part of that drainage basin and um, so um, if you look at the red line there that red line separates drainage basins that flow into Lake Erie from drainage basins that flow south into the Ohio River Notice that the city of Akron is right on the line. So one, the northern part of the city, uh, the water flows into the Lake Erie. The southern part of the city, the water flows into the Ohio River through the Muskingum drainage basin. Uh, so some question, a question about drainage basins. Why is the volume of water in the Mississippi River about 10 times greater than the volume of water in the Nile River? Well, the Mississippi River drainage basin receives more rain. And Nile rivers in a in a um, in a desert area. Um, why do stream patterns look like branches of a tree? Well, streams will flow follow the path of least resistance, and they form valleys where rock is most readily eroded or following the steepest slope. We call that a dendritic drainage pattern, um, where the geology is rel relatively uniform, and we see a, a dendritic pattern right there. Um, the tips of the V's in a dendritic pattern come together to point downstream. Um, very typical uh, drainage pattern where you don't get changes in geology. I see a trellis drainage pattern where I have a ridge and valley type of geology and that's common in the Appalachian Mountains where um, I have uh, harder rocks sticking up as ridges and then the softer rocks in between those harder formations um, weather down and I, I get valleys and they, they, they kind of line up in, in straight lines. So the main streams go down the valleys and then the uh, smaller streams um, like in a trellis um, um, drain into the larger ones. And so I, the idea is I can look from the top and fr from a map and look at the drainage patterns. I don't have I don't necessarily have to know that the geology is a is a ridge and valley geology with with mountains but I can I can tell there's mountains there just by looking at the pattern of the streams without having ever gone there a rectangular pattern is common where you have joints and fractures and the, the water will follow those joints or fractures until they hit an obstruction and then scoot over to the next joint or fracture and then a volcano because Volcanoes um, radiate from all sides. We'll have a radiator, radial pattern of drainage around them. If I look at the drainage patterns in this kind of a map, what would you expect in, in, in this um, the geology to be like in each of these colors? Well, let's look at the, the purple color in the middle. You notice that it's, it's a trellis where you have long ridges and um, then smaller streams radiating, radiating out into them. Whereas the um, coastal plain area to the right, the, um, to the right of the purple in Virginia and Maryland, uh, it's a dendritic pattern because the geology is fairly uniform. Let's spend some time looking at the Arkansas River Basin. Uh, the United States is divided into um, multiple uh, regions that the U.S. Geological Survey uh, uh, maps out. There's some really good websites that you can go to and you can actually map out a drainage pattern um, for a part of the United States that you live in. 
Um, I've mapped that out in this uh, in this PowerPoint and then copied it and put it in the PowerPoint here for the Arkansas River Valley and we'll look at that in a minute. But every every water um, shed and every drainage uh, stream in the United States has been mapped out and is monitored by the U.S. Geological Survey. Here's the Arkansas River Basin. It's part of Region 11 on the USGS Watershed Guide. And there's a website that takes you to that. And that river basin goes all the way from western, central western Colorado um, through Canyon City and Pueblo, um, through Dodge City, Great Bend, Wichita, Kansas, um, Tulsa, uh, Muskogee, um, in North, northeast Oklahoma, Fort Smith, Arkansas, Conway, Arkansas, Little Rock, and Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and empties into the um, into the Mississippi River in southeast Arkansas. So that's the Arkansas River Basin. South of that is the Red River Basin. East of that is the White River Basin. And all of those make up Region 11 in the USGS Guide. And it's worth going to the website to go see how that guide works because there's lots of good information out there. Here's a drainage pattern I put together from that website down listed there. It's a national national atlas. I can make a map. I can make my own kind of map based on a, a regional area. And um, this is an interesting exercise because I can just take a pencil and draw the drainage based on where the drainage um, starts and where it stops as a way to know where the river basin is. So if I, if I overlay the basin um, colors on top of that drainage pattern, it looks something like this. And then if I start to, I can draw um, a line where, say, north or east of that red line, the drainage will deal to the north and east, and south and west of that red line, the, the, the drainage will jump, um, jump into the Arkansas River Basin. Um, east of that line is the Meridazine Osage River Basin. So uh, the, the nice thing about the, looking at the drainage pattern is that I can um, know um, where water is going in the area I'm living and start to understand what's happening um, with uh, the water that's such a valuable resource um, in whatever region I'm, I'm living and working. So I overlay all of it there, and we can, yeah, I can, you can see where it all kind of fits together. The map scales aren't quite right, but that's as good as I could get with the, with the scales that I've got. So they're, they overlay real well. I mean, it's all the same map. Let's look specifically at the Illinois watershed. Drainage basins have multiple watersheds in them. And the Illinois watershed is important because it's at the very top watershed and there's no other watershed that that drains into it. Um, it's important in Oklahoma because the Illinois River has been one of the most beautiful rivers that has um, that that Oklahoma has. Unfortunately, because of chicken manure, chicken manure spread raw chicken manure spread on the fields in uh, eastern Oklahoma and northwest Arkansas has just destroyed that river. When I uh, first moved to Oklahoma in um, early 90s, see Lake Tullahassee, that lake in the very far southwest part of that watershed, Lake Tenkiller. You could swim in that lake and see 30 feet in beautiful clear water. Well, now it's all cloudy. Um, you can't see very well because raw uncomposted manure from chicken industry has polluted the watershed. So much for um, um, whether we want cheap chicken or whether we want nice watersheds. Pollution's an issue. So here's an overlay of the uh, Illinois River watershed and where that um, where that um, compares to the overall um, drainage basin. So the concept here is you have lots of watersheds that go into a drainage basin. Uh, here's a closer up map of that. Um, notice where the cities are in um, eastern Oklahoma, northwest Arkansas, and it empties into the Arkansas River in the very far southwest corner through Lake Tenkiller. The definition that is important to know is the word gradient. 
It's one of the factors that affects stream flow. And basically, it's the slope of the stream. It's the change in elevation of the stream over a horizontal distance. So if I um, travel from um, here to the um, Gulf of Mexico um, and follow the um, um, follow along the Arkansas River and then um, then travel down the Mississippi River um, I'd be following the gradient of those two rivers. Um, so where's the stream's gradient highest? Near the headwaters or near the mouth? Well, it'd be the, it'd be the highest because it would be steeper in the mountains and more gentle in the uh, mouth of the stream. Well, how about the features you see in this picture compared to what you'd observe in a low gradient river? Well, what we see here is we have um, a mountain a mountain stream and as you continue down the stream um, from the mountain stream you, you experience seeing less rock more gravel then more sand and eventually more fine-grained silt and mud and by the mouth of the river it's, it's pretty much all you get is silt and mud um, well here's an interesting question which which uh, stream flows faster the high gradient part of the stream up in the mountains or the low gradient part down river? Well, actually, the low gradient part travels faster. And the reason is, is because the water is so turbulent in this upper area that it has to go around uh, all these rocks and it takes longer for the water to travel, um, say, a mile down river here than it would um, in the uh, low gradient part of the river. If we look at a cross section of a river and just take a rectangular pan and pretend that's what the riverbed looks like, um, we could look at how uh, that would affect uh, the uh, stream flow as well. There's a term called wetted perimeter, and the wetted perimeter is the length of the surface of the channel banks in the bed that are in contact with the water. So in the uh, picture we got here, in A, the wetted perimeter um, is uh, um, 1 meter plus 10 meters plus another 1 meter, or 12 meters. In the lower picture, you've got 5 meters plus 500 meters plus another 5 meters, or 510 meters. Um, <clears throat> a large cross-sectional area compared to wetted perimeter um, is... Uh, related to a large hydraulic radius and therefore a relatively a high stream velocity. So the higher the hydraulic radius, the um, higher the velocity of the stream. So in the case of the stream B, the radius um, is much larger, therefore it will have a lot higher velocity than the stream above. So not, not only are the uh, the turbulence of the rocks affecting the rate of the um, the rate of the river? Also, just the ra radius, the size of the riverbed affects how fast the river can go, and um, that's a second factor that would mean that a um, the stream downriver goes faster than one up in the mountains. Um, <clears throat> downstream channel roughness is generally reduced. And hydraulic radius increases, therefore stream velocity um, increases downstream. Stream discharge equals the volume of water that passes at a given point in one second. And here, um, discharge in meters squared per second equals the width of the stream, in this case five meters, the depth of the stream, in this case two meters, and the velocity of the stream, in this case 10 meters per second. So that gives the amount of water that's passing any point at one time. Um, <clears throat> here's a fun fact. Five, 50 million gallons of water discharge into the Atlantic Ocean from the Amazon River every second. 500 million gallons of water every second discharge from the Amazon River into the Atlantic Ocean. That's a lot of water.
Some scientists predict that global warming will result in a corresponding increase in evaporation in the oceans. How would this affect discharge from the Amazon River? Well, would it increase or decrease or stay the same? And it would increase because um, <clears throat> if you have more evaporation from the oceans, that means you have more rainfall. And that means you'd have more rainfall um, going into the Amazon River Basin and on down the Amazon River. All streams erode particles from channel beds and banks and carry them downstream. We're looking at a picture of the same area in the stream. And um, this is an area around Mount St. Helens. And it's after Mount St. Helens erupted. And the pictures are 12 months apart. And notice how much material was carried downstream just in that 12 months in that uh, uh, creek bed that got covered over originally by the Mount St. Helens eruption. Erosion produces stream load, which is a combination of bed load, suspended load, and dissolved load. So this is an important concept to know that stream load includes a bed load. In other words, um, the um, uh, stuff moving down river along the bounces and slides and rolls and along the um, uh, saltation where sand bounces. Um, saltation's the real word. I'm just saying bounce. And, um, <clears throat> and then you get... Uh, suspended uh, uh, suspended load like silt and clay and turbulence moves in around the river and you see those little blue lines where the suspended load is moving and then you get dissolved load that you can't see that is dissolved in the water and that would be like salts and things like that dissolved in the in the water so how's stream color affected by the load well uh, <clears throat> if you have lots of uh, red silt and clay dissolving out of the rocks, out of the, um, the uh, uh, soils and that going into the river, it's going to have a suspended load of um, red silt and clay and the water's going to be red. Um, the Arkansas River flowing through the gypsum hills of southern, southern Kansas has lots of suspended load or dissolved load of gypsum in it. And um, so, a suspended load increases when discharge increases. In other words, the stream has a higher velocity, so it has more energy to move particles. Basically, the water moves faster and it has bigger stuff that it moves downstream. Here's one of these um, little pictures that if you right click it and then click play, it will go ahead and show you these loads, the, the um, gravel and rolling and sliding and um, then also the uh, suspended load those little particles and dissolved load so you need to know those three types of loads in a river okay the Amazon River has ten times the discharge of the Mississippi but it carries only three times the load why might this be what factors account for the difference well the source materials are different and the soils are because they have different characteristics. Um, so the Amazon River has a, a forest around it, or traditionally has, and so that has kept stuff from getting into the water. Um, as the forest is cut down, that, that will change, and there will be more load in the Amazon River. Um, there's also differential weathering histories in the two regions. Um, the area around the Amazon is more densely vegetated, and um, so those, for those reasons, um, there's a lot more discharge in the Mississippi River. The Yellow River in China <clears throat> carries more sediment than any other river on Earth, any other major river on Earth. But look at the, sand, look at the um, area of China it's going through, just bare rock, and so it just washes on down into the river. And then the uh, um, last picture on the right here, you see a braided channel in Alaska and uh, a braided channel is a shallow river and so because it's shallow it doesn't stay in one bank and the parts of the stream get um, 
moved out all over a real flat kind of plain. In the United States, the um, Platte River through Nebraska is a braided stream. This is a good slide to summarize um, what we see going down through a meandering river. We just saw a picture of a um, of a, a braided stream. Well, this is a, a meandering stream. In a meandering stream, you have a floodplain, which is a flat area that and as the river moves through that floodplain, it will meander back and forth in the floodplain. Now it may be in one channel one time and then come back 10 years later, it's in a totally different part of the floodplain. And the reason is, is um, summarized in this picture here. As a stream slows down, it drops some of its load. Heavy particles drop out first. So in A, you're seeing um, the little A to A prime uh, cross section there in the river and the brown part there is where you have a slower water and the dark blue part is where you have really fast water so the blue part is cutting into the bank and the brown part is dumping material on the inside of that meander and then B um, it's not it's just kind of in the middle of the stream and the maximum velocity is in the middle. And then C, it goes back the other way so that the maximum velocity is on the left and minimum is on the right. So um, the outside of the meander, it's cutting, and the inside of the meander, it's um, dumping material. And, and um, uh, this, we looked at that when we looked at, um, at uh, um, Clastic sediment, sediment, sedimentology and looked at the clastic rocks and the type of bedding you get in clastic rocks and that's um, that's the process that creates um, a uh, uh, when, when you look when you look at the bank and, and go to a road cut you can actually see the kind of deposits you get from this kind of a uh, a process of meandering back and forth on a floodplain. Um, so here's a good example in the picture at the bottom. Um, you got a point bar on the inside of the meander and then um, you can't see it because there's vegetation but on the clear on the right side you see a little bare bank that's where the, the bank is cut into so we call it a cut bank. And here's a good example of channel migration in a river. And um, this happens to be a river in Bolivia. But um, in, the, in the top, we see the river in 2003. In the bottom, we see that same river in 1990. Notice all the different channels in that river. And even, um, even some of the channels have, uh, have um, left have left old lakes behind and we call those lakes oxbow lakes. Um, you can see a picture of an oxbow lake on the right side where the the lake meander used to go through that lake and then it um, during a flood state it cut off that meander and left that old lake there. In the process at the bottom of the picture you can see that process. So you have a meander, the original river, and then because the cut banks get closer and closer eventually those cut banks connect and when they connect then the river um, uh, then the river goes right straight down across and eventually it will silt up the edges of the uh, the edges and uh, leave that oxbow lake um, uh, stranded and it's a very common process in um, river floodplains. Here's a picture that shows the process of meandering stream. I'm going to right click it and then click play. You may need to do the same thing. And what we see here is water coming through the river and then um, depositing um, sand and silt on the point bar. Water continues to come down the river. Eventually it cuts off um, and join, it cuts off and joins the parts of the uh, stream that were the cut banks and then silts in leaving a lake where both meanders were and then starts the process all over again. So I'm going to play it once more here 
so I can kind of look through it. And so you have deposition and erosion, deposition and erosion, point bars are deposition, cut banks are erosion. And eventually the cut banks cut back to the point where they join and then water um, will eventually silt in the edges of those oxbow lakes. One thing we find with rivers is when they hit the body of water like um, when the Mississippi River goes into the Gulf of Mexico and you hit the mouth of the river it dumps its sediment because it's been carrying the sediment because the river has been moving and then when it hits the body of the water the uh, the, the rate the velocity of the uh, Gulf of Mexico water is just much less and it just dumps the sediment right there in that quieter water um, and so what you get is these uh, fingers going out into the body of water carrying sediment and then um, it dumps and so that Mississippi River um, mouth is always changing and uh, that's a challenge because depending on where people live uh, that might uh, create issues for them so we have a sediment we have a uh, um, distributary channels and then the whole thing you're looking at is the delta okay here's a concept map uh, that links together some of the components so just to go through some of it um, a stream flow is runoff from a drainage basin and drainage basins have tributaries tributaries have dendritic radial rectangular trellis patterns go to the middle um, we measure stream flow as discharge and that dis discharge um, um, goes into tributaries and then from tributaries to drainage basins and um, so anyway this this is just kind of putting our concepts and putting them together okay we're going to change subjects now and look at floods and a flood is a temporary overflow of a river onto adjacent lands not normally covered by water um, here you see a, a house that um, would not normally be have water in their front or backyard and um, might as well go fishing since it's flooded anyway. Well, floods usually occur when the amount of water on land surface exceeds the volume of water that can be transported in a stream in a stream channel and absorbed in the surrounding soil. So a flood is influenced or caused by um, you know you may get a lot of rain or a lot of snow um, you, humans can change the physical landscape and create floods. For example, you start paving over some of the big box stores and the parking lots have a lot more runoff. Well, that runoff can create um, flooding if um, you aren't cognizant of where that runoff's going because it was going down into the groundwater at that point, but it has to move because it can't go through cement or, or pavement. Okay, so that has to do with the capability of the ground to absorb water, um, just like I was saying. It's also influenced by evaporation rates. Um, if you have, it's real wet, it's not evaporating, you, you may get um, more flooding. And also physical characteristics of the stream system. One of the issues that we get up in, in South Dakota, in the Missouri River area when it floods, is you get ice that um, ends up blocking the river so then it ends up damming and creates floods and so that that's an example of a physical characteristic that that, that um, is a particular issue there the most common cause of flooding is is too much precipitate precipitation uh, for example in 1993 the mississippi river flooded and it was caused by um, just lots more rain uh, during uh, it's, you can see the graph there and the average rain is in green but then in June and May, June and July in 1993 it, it rained much more than normal and um, also if you have a storm it can dump rain just all at once and um, so you get amount of rainfall and suddenly uh, all at once and suddenly that water has to go somewhere so it it spills over the stream banks and uh, <clears throat> now 
1993, the Mississippi River flood was the largest flood in U.S. history. And there's, there's the drainage basin that uh, uh, was affected. So, the whole state of Iowa was affected. <laughs> okay, in arid and southwestern states, floods occur because channels often have no surface water in them most of the year, and so you get brief, intense storms and the flash flood. Um, like I was saying earlier, in North Dakota and South Dakota, um, you can get um, you can get um, ice blocking and backing up a river and forming a temporary lake which then causes a flood. Um, so how do humans cover how do humans influence flooding? Well um, we put in a parking lot and it doesn't absorb water it creates more runoff. Or storm sewers divert water from surfaces and dump it into natural streams causing them to flood. Um, where it, 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 if the land was absorbing water and then you start um, paving streets and then um, dumping water into storm sewers, that's a lot more water for rivers to handle. And um, <clears throat> then, then uh, construction constructed dams sometimes create a flood. If the if the if the break if the dam breaks, it can flood on downriver. So that's different ways humans can create flooding. Well, what are five factors that inf influence flooding? Well, you could talk about how much rain it, how much it rains, how fast it rains, how much, you know, how, um, what's the duration of the rain? Uh, slope of the land affects flooding. Um, how fast snow melts affects flooding. You may have ice dams. Urban runoff affects flooding. If you remove vegetation, it, creates flooding or a collapse of dams or a failure of flood control structures can flood. Uh, when Katrina hit um, New Orleans, it flooded in New Orleans because the flood control structure um, north, uh, on the south side of Lake Pontchartrain gave way and so the uh, um, uh, New Orleans flooded. You may, as, as you go by um, and drive along the road, you may see little uh, buildings like this. And every stream in the U.S. has a um, way to measure the depth of water in the channel. And you can actually go online and look at the depth of water on any channel in the U.S. It's really interesting because it's real-time data. And um, the USGS has 7,000 stream gauges and probably more than that because this is... Um, this was put together a few years ago and one exercise is interesting is to look in the area that you live in and look at the history of um, the water streams in the area you live. If we take an example and you could look an example in your hometown of the creek of the creek in your hometown on the on the website um, on the US government website but um, this shows you um, how high the water was in that bed at different times. So you can see there must have been a rain on July 10th and 11th because suddenly there's a lot of water in that um, stream bed on J between July 10th and 12th. Same with July 14th and 16th. Must have had a rain um, the night of July 14th and the morning of the 15th, probably the night of the 14th. And then it all starts to dry up, and you get a really low stream bed on July, just after July 20th. It starts so. Um, this is really important because then you can look on the internet and see what any stream and what that stream's doing. Okay, so there's where the U.S. stream stream discharge is available. Water.usgs.gov. Uh, historical stream information is available, and um, you can look. At, or scientists can look at graphs of maximum stream discharge versus recurrence interval to estimate the discharge of a 100-year flood. So if you look at the graph here, you can see um, how often you get, 
how much discharge or water coming out of a stream area and that's going to let you know um, whether the flood is recurring every year or every two years or uh, if we go on up the ladder 10 years 20 30 40 50 or even 100 years Um, an analysis of flood data in metropolitan areas over the last century suggests that floods caused by similar volumes of precipitation are actually larger and more devastating today despite advances in flood monitoring. monitoring. Why is that? Well, uh, for one thing, um, there, you have more people paving over more streets and you have um, more people probably living in areas where they and putting population pressure on flood areas where they might not have lived in the past and plus the um, structures that are being built in the flood areas are probably a lot more expensive and so you um, a lot more money is being um, being uh, affected by those floods than they used to be and so here's what the book says associate your common experience with many community that many communities have experienced a significant period of housing and retail construction over the past couple of decades and uh, so that's basically what we just said okay back to the mississippi river flood um, it floods every now and then um, same with the missouri river you can see floods if you drive through the area well, this is the city of, of Des Moines, Iowa, and it was inundated by floodwaters. And you can see that uh, floodwaters through the city in the top picture. And then in Missouri, uh, this corn crop was just destroyed by the flooding. So why should we care about flood control? Well, one reason is um, it's really expensive when cities are in floodplains makes you wonder why we build the cities in floodplains and why we continue to build them when we could just build them on higher ground. But we don't. We continue to um, build our downtown areas in floodplains and then we put big, big um, um, uh, dikes to keep the flood water from getting into our cities. And then secondly, floodwaters contain, contain contain all kinds of contaminated stuff in them. Sewage, agricultural chemicals, and the list goes on. Um, dead animals, <laughs> flood waters, nasty stuff. Um, and roads can get submerged in floods and they have to be repaired. So they tear up the road and uh, then the road's unusable once it's torn up. Um, when farmland is submerged, uh, the crops don't grow. And then um, once that flood water recedes from the farmland, you might have a whole, you know, I know when the Missouri River flooded, um, uh, in, in some cases it left a foot of sand over the soil. Well, the corn can't grow in the sand, so now what do you do? Your topsoil is a foot down. Uh, so that's a problem then for the farmer. And barge traffic goes on rivers, and if you have floods, then barge traffic may be too dangerous for the bar barges to uh, go down the river or up the river. Um, and 2,700 people were killed by floods in the Limpopo River in Mozambique. And the river in A on the left shows river in the normal year. And B during some floods. Wow, is that a lot more water in B? The width, the width of the river swelled more than 80 miles in some locations. 80 miles wider than it was before the flooding. Well, we can try and stop floods and prevent them. Or we can adjust our lifestyle to deal with them effectively. And uh, we can adjust, that's adjustment. And you're going to want to know uh, the difference between preventing floods and adjusting adjustment with floods. Um, here's an example of levees. Levees are artificial uh, barriers that are raised embankments along a stream. Um, they're constructed to protect neighboring lands from rising floodwaters. 
and um, this is an example in the bottom of a, a levee area in West Virginia to protect potential flooding along the Potomac rivers. Um, where my parents live up in Kansas, the Meridazine River has big levees along the side of it and, and until the, the uh, Pomona Dam was put in place and it's a Corps of Engineers Lake and those levees were put in place, they used to have flooding in that part of uh, Kansas. Well, floodway is a diversion channel that will transport floodwaters away from inhabited areas. And um, what you see, that green area on the right, is a floodway that's built so that it can divert floodwaters from the Red River so that they go around there instead of through Winnipeg um, and try and keep flooding from occurring in Winnipeg. This is an example of prevention. It's not adjustment because you're not adjusting yourself, adjusting your lifestyle to the flood. You're trying to prevent flooding in Winnipeg by putting in a floodway. Um, dams are used uh, to control flooding and uh, this is another example of prevention. Um, so we put lots of dams here in the Kansas River Basin and um, <clears throat> you see one of those dams in Wilson Lake in north central Kansas and uh, you got to have enough area in the lake to handle all the extra water that might come in flood time. So the Corps of Engineers is always working on, well, how empty they do they need to keep the lake so that they can add more water in during flood, but at the same time, recreation is important, and if you don't have any water in there, you can't go, uh, you can't go fishing and, um, and uh, um, have a nice place to go boating so anyway they have to they have to try and balance that and the floor, Corps of Engineer does a pretty good job with that <clears throat> so the storage facility has to be big enough to accommodate all the extra water that comes in from flooding well adjustment tactics might be to um, relocate the city to higher ground you get enough flooding and it might just be better to just um, have the whole city move or at least yourself. Um, you might increase sales tax to fund, fund projects to modify land use. Um, you might restore wetlands along riverbanks. Instead of building houses on them, you'd go ahead and let it flood. It's okay. And uh, you might keep development from happening in areas that were prone, prone to flooding. This is all adjusting our lifestyle. Instead of living on a riverbank, we let the ducks live there. Anyway, that's restoring our life. That's adjusting. Well, FEMA has created, this was created to provide financial assistance to those affected by natural disasters, including floods. So that's, that's another adjustment tactic to just pay people when they have troubles. Okay, let's put a check mark on the appropriate column so we can get an, used to an idea of what's prevention and what's adjustment, because this is an important concept for you to know. If you construct, construct a levee, that's prevention because you're trying to prevent an area from being flooded by something you constructed. Whereas if, the, if there's been a flood happen and the um, newspaper publishes an evacuation route, you're keeping people from getting killed, but um, it's still flooding. You haven't prevented anything, so that's adjustment. And if you create new housing developments that are elevated on pilings above ground, that would be adjustment because now we're getting used to living somewhere that's not at ground level. We're adjusting our lifestyle. Um, if you dredge sediment out of stream to give stream channel a bigger channel to work with to not flood, then that's preventing a flood or potentially preventing a flood. And if you put flood, flood zone maps in the local library so people can uh, know where the floodplain is, that's adjustment because they're adjusting their purchasing decisions or um, other decisions based on what they're reading in the library. And also if you relocate buildings that would be an adjustment because it's still going to flood you're just relocating the building. If a dam is constructed upstream that would be prevention because you're putting water behind the dam instead of letting it go and uh, cover the city. 
and if you have zoning regulations that are enacted to prevent new construction on a floodplain so that people can just build their houses up in the hills instead of letting the developers just build them on floodplains, um, then that would be adjustment.